And in, in just a minute, we're going to see a, a very short video, about a, a minute and a half, two minutes, um, just from the Alliance. We are a Christian Missionary Alliance church, and one of the, one of the themes of the Alliance in sending missionaries to um, all over the world, um, many, many, many countries throughout the world, is to the hard places. So we are going to see a little bit about um, some missions work that's happening in Japan. And um, has anybody ever here ever lived in Japan? Anybody ever lived there? Well, I, I asked that question. I was in a church where there was a, a Japanese missionary uh, child who was in that church. So I was just curious. Um, not Japan, but um, it, being a hard place. Uh, Melanie and I were in Taiwan, and um, while not the same, they're, they're different cultures, um, but still a very hard place and kind of right next door. So there's a lot of this that um, I think I, I very much understand. But um, a very, very interesting video that kind of uh, just reveals a bit about um, what the Alliance is doing in some of the hard places of the world. So we're just going to see that. Thank you, Alliance family, for sending new workers to Japan. We're the Strobes, and we arrived in January. The Lord was just gracious to us in our journey of revealing that we were to go overseas and that we were to go to Japan, and just knowing that we're obeying the call. I've been reflecting a lot on counting the cost of the call and these like competing emotions too, because then the airport is like, we're hitting this next phase, like we're, we're going. And so that's super exciting. And my family was supporting us and cheering us on. And so it was kind of that clash of emotion. I started an intensive language school. I find myself on their little flashcard app, practicing phrases they taught us that I could be prepared for the next class. We are just trying to go on outings, check out the parks, learn stuff about our city. And then in the evenings, I'm trying to work on learning Japanese. I've introduced myself a couple of times to moms at the park. It's just been very encouraging to me, God's kindness to our family, because I was just thinking about our two toddlers and how they would transition. That's just felt like very gracious of God to just let them transition well. I think just that prayer that we can be tenacious at language school so that we can be tenacious to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. Without the Alliance Family's prayer and support, it wouldn't be possible for us to be in Japan or anywhere else across the ocean, away from family, away from friends, and away from cultural norms. And that, that gets us through some days. It's an encouragement to know that the church is behind us and the Alliance family is behind us and praying for us and on our, on our team and on our side in a place that's hard and unreached for the gospel. There's not a choice because you know, if no one's willing to go, then these people will never hear. So if the harvest is plentiful here, the workers must come here. So actually, a, um, <laughs> that's kind of funny in a way. Um, we should share about this sometime. Is, um, so Tristan was born in Taiwan, um, which is interesting. And he has a, he has a Chinese birth certificate. And um, he's an American citizen. He's all, <laughs> he's all legit and, and <laughs> all legal and everything. We had, we had a little bit of trouble when we thought when we were so trying to get out of, of Taiwan, we had no idea if, because they have mandatory military service at 18 years old, so we had no idea if we could take him out of the country and if he's going to be called back for mandatory military service. So trying to dig through and sort all, all that out was actually quite difficult because the Taiwanese, uh, they don't believe in being subjective, so they don't want to give you definite answers is what that means. 
So I would call this government office. Can I take my child out of the country? Well, maybe. And I'm like, maybe what? And then, well, call this number. They'll be able to tell you. So I call this government office. Can I take my child out of the country? Well, maybe. Well, maybe you should call this office. This went on and on and on and on. Eventually, we booked tickets and we left. So <laughs> that's, how, that's how that worked. So um, he, uh, yeah, he has an, uh, what's called an American uh, report of birth abroad is what he has. Um, but anyways, that was all. It's all part of God's plan. And my mom came over for um, when he was born. And this is a joke, too. I might as well share it. She, it was funny. She came over. Okay, my mom comes from Boonville, New York. Who knows where Boonville, New York is? All right, yep. It's a tiny little town, kind of like a we go, tiny little town. It's one of those tiny little towns that everybody knows where it is. You, you know what I mean? It's like, it's this tiny little place, but everybody knows where Boonville is. So my mom flew over um, for when Tristan was born, and she came off the plane in a stream, this whole stream of... of tiny little Taiwanese people, okay? And I was waiting for her, and she saw me there, and the first thing she said to me was, there's so many Taiwanese people here. <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, here we, there was a lot of Taiwanese people here in Taiwan. Yes, there's a lot of them. So just a little, little joke about that. <clears throat> so uh, let's pray together, and we'll get into the message for today. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. I would just ask that you, your word would go forth, that it would be planted in our hearts, that you would grow um, that seed to produce abundant fruit in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so last week, um, I'm going to go through just a few notes that we had from last week about sort of bringing us back to, as a reminder, where we left off last week. Um, the first one was, so this is really a, a continuation of change, growth, and maturity that we started last week. So just to kind of bring us back, the first note that I shared with you last week is that newness of life that Christ gives is fresh and full of opportunity. And new life is not like it was before. And the second one was, I can learn to love change when fo I focus on completing God's work for my life. And that message last week was based off of Romans 6, 4. And so it was diving into the newness of life that Christ died to give us. So Romans 6, 4 was, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So we also explored aspects of change, growth and maturity, and when change and growth are seen as opportunities to mature, we become less resistant and less fearful of what God's trying to do in our lives. So today, we're going to study other aspects of change, growth, uh, newness, maturity, and how they help us to grow in our Christian faith. And for this, we're going to be finding some more things in Romans. So, um, we are going to look at the context of what's happening for this passage in Romans that we're going to use in Romans 7. This chapter of the book of, the Ro of Romans, it's about law, the law, sin, and freedom from the law. And Paul's struggle, as he, as he wrote about this, him struggling with, I want to do what is good, but then when, every time I want to do what's good, the sin that lives within me, it's right there, and I don't do what's good, even though I want to. And it's a very relatable struggle for all of us. We want to do what is good as believers, but yet the sin is right there. So Romans 7 highlights this human struggle with sin and also the purpose of the law. It reminds us that while we battle with sin, we are not condemned to a life of sinfulness. So our struggle underscores our need for a savior, and it calls us to lean into the grace that's offered through Jesus Christ, our ultimate deliverer. So we're going to be in Romans 7, but I want to give you some background about uh, verses 1 through 6, what leads up to this. So 1 through 6 is about being released from the law by death. Paul uses the analogy of marriage to explain that believers are released from the law through death. 
specifically the death of Jesus Christ. And they are free to belong to Christ, who was raised from the dead, and bear fruit to God. As Romans 7 goes on, it talks about this inner conflict that I just mentioned. Paul describes the struggle with sin within him, a war between his inner being that delights in God's law, and it is it an, another that is at work in his body that fights against that, and it makes him a prisoner to the law of sin. And he ends this chapter with a cry for deliverance and a word of thanks to God. Romans 7 is profound because it speaks about a struggle with sin and how the law actually amplifies the sinful nature. Here, Paul delves into the intricacies of human nature, explaining how the law, while it's good, reveals our sinful tendencies, and thus it underscores our desperate need for deliverance and to have a savior. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 7, 4 through 6. Romans chapter 7, 4 through 6. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work within us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what was once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So I love how Paul refers to other believers and looks at them. He calls them brothers and sisters. And this is very much for a reason. And we all need to look at each other as brothers and sisters in the faith because that is what we are and it's these brothers and sisters that he says have died to the law when paul says that believers have died to the law he uses the word thanatos this means separation from the life and salvation of god forever so we must first experience death to the self in order to experience his gift of salvation and new life. So this is your first sermon note here, is that salvation requires us to die to what we want. Because man's sinful nature only wants to resist God. So in, in going along with this, we must follow the path of Jesus himself, who did not seek his own will, but he sought the will of the Father. Jesus not only said to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, that's Matthew 16, 24. He also said, not my will, but let your will be done in Luke 22, 42. So when it comes to change in our lives, our response needs to be that of Jesus himself. Deny yourself, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus, while being God himself, said he came to do the will of the Father, John 6, 38. So isn't that the purpose of our lives as Christians? I was just having this conversation with Melanie just the other day. I, I looked at her and I said, are we really about the Father's business? Are we really? Or am I about what I want to do today? You know? It makes you think. So a very easy way for us to discern, and we've talked about this before, the will, are, are we seeking the will of the Father? We just observe our own speech. How many of our sentences begin with the word I in a day? I want to do this. I want to go here. I want this to be like this. How many of our sentences every day begin with God, <coughs> Jesus, or the Holy Spirit? God is telling me this. 
Jesus is teaching me this. The Holy Spirit is leading me to such and such. So this is a very easy way to figure out the will of God. And if you, can, if you think that you are hearing from God and you can find it closely related to Scripture, then you're on the right track. This is your second note here. Observe how many things you say begin with I versus how many things begin with God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit. When we have died to the law, Paul was referring to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the sacrificial system of keeping the law. And big one that everybody knows, the Ten Commandments, right? So that man could have right relationship with God. But it was never enough. God demands a blood payment for sins. And the Old Testament included endless animal sacrifice, day and night, so that the sins of the nation of Israel could be atoned for. And this is a great word that is used in Scripture. Atonement. What does this mean? Atonement. At one meant. A state of being at one with God. And it's so phenomenal because Adam and Eve, it says they walked with God in the, cool, in the garden in the cool of the day, right? They walked with God. They walked with God a state of atonement, a state of being at one with God before sin entered the world. They were at one with God. This is also the state that all believers now live in because they have accepted Jesus Christ as the perfect blood sacrifice for the atonement of their sins. Jesus' blood washes you clean so that you can be at one with God. A, a, a state of being at one. <clears throat> Paul was saying that we have died to this law. We have died to it in the same way that we experience a physical death, which means you would be separated, a physical death, um, without Jesus Christ, you will be separated from the life of God forever. So we have to consider our flesh, the old man, the old way of having right relationship with God as if it is completely dead. The old way is dead. Self-effort, self-righteousness, Anything you can do to earn right relationship with God and for forgiveness of sin, all of that is dead. And we have to see it that way. We just talked this week in the men's group about, okay, what is the thing that makes you a Christian? Is it how good you are? No. There is one thing that makes you a Christian. Is it the amount of good works you do? No. There is one thing that makes you a Christian, and there is one way to heaven, and that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. There's nothing else that makes you a Christian. That is the defining factor. It is the one thing. So anything else we have to consider as far as earning right relationship with God, that it's dead. Okay? That's what Paul's saying here. So we need to see it that way. We have to see our flesh as dead. Question, do people of the world who don't know Jesus, do they do good things? Sure. Do they have salvation? No. Right? So there is one thing that makes you a Christian. Okay? We also got into the discussion of why do we do good works? Well, we do them to bring honor to God and as a witness and as a testimony, but it's all about what is the inspiration behind that. The inspiration behind that is not I'm earning my way because if you're earning your way, you are no different than the world. You're no different at all. There is no earning with God for salvation. It's accepting. So anything that belongs to the flesh, as it was works of the flesh in the Old Testament, the law in the old covenant, um, that, that's how there was the atonement for our sins, but it was never enough. So anyone who has flesh, a body, 
a soul that's still in the process of transformation for believers, which involves constant change, right? If we're going to become more and more and more like Jesus, we must constantly change, right? We have to change constantly. God is, he's, 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 he's changing us. He's, he's changing how you think about this, how you see this, how you act, how you, how you feel. Like God is constantly changing us, right? So this is called sanctification, this process of becoming more like Jesus. The flesh will always crave the former way of doing things by self-effort. And I don't know why, because it's pointless. So we will never earn our salvation with God under the old covenant, the old way. And it's sad to see that every other faith or just secular humanism in the world is in one way or another thinks they need to earn something in order to go to heaven or something like that. In order to, to, to have a, a release from this life, to attain what, what they think heaven might be. The whole world does that, right? But we don't do that. We are holy. We are separate. We are different. All we do is receive and accept the gift of salvation that God gives us. But for some reason, the flesh wants to earn it. It wants to earn it. And this is one concept that could be taught every single day, and you could study every single day for the rest of your life, and we would never fully get it, that there is no other way other than to say to God, okay, that's it. When it comes to salvation, you just accept it. There's no earning. It is a gift, okay? So this is until we begin to see and understand that the flesh, these, these works that we want to do, the self that Jesus is talking about when he says, deny yourself, we must acknowledge the truth that the old us, who we used to be, the old man, before we came to salvation, it is, he is dead. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Notice this doesn't say, I live by faith in the Son of God who I love. You see that? So the focus is on God's work of loving you, not on your work of loving God. You see? This emphasis, and it's all throughout Scripture, it's not about how much you love God. It's about how much God loves you. Okay? So, there are really, really great theological studies that get very, very deep into what is this that I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I want to highlight a parallel for the purpose of this message today. In the same way that the believer must consider their flesh dead to the works of the law in attempt to gain forgiveness from God or to, to gain heaven, salvation, we need to see that when our flesh rises up against change in our life, because didn't we just say that man's nature only wants to resist God? Okay, so why isn't everybody a believer? Because they're in rebellion against God. Their nature wants to resist this free offer of salvation. Otherwise, everybody would be saved, right? Right? Everybody would just, yes, this is awesome, and they just accept. There's some, there's a, there, and Paul was talking about this. There's this war. The sinful nature does not want the things of God. Why does the Bible say that the word of God is foolishness to those who are perishing? Right? Non-believers do not want the things of God. <laughs> they don't want it. I often say that they want everything that God is. Love, oh, that's a great thing. Peace, I love peace. Joy, I love joy. Do you want God? No. <laughs> right? The sinful nature does not want the things of God. It's the flesh. It's evil. So we need to see when God starts to bring change into your life, because that's what this is about. When our flesh wants to rise up against that and resist it, 
the frustration or the resistance that wells up within us just when we thought that we've gotten everything just the way we want it. When God steps into our lives and leads us in a new direction, or when he enters in and pulls and stretches us in new ways that are uncomfortable, or ways that we just simply don't like, in those moments, right in the middle of that, when you have these feelings of resistance or I want it my way, those things belong to the flesh. They are not of God. They're of the flesh. And even when you're feeling it in the moment, you need to say, these things are dead. Feelings feel very real, don't they? In the moment, they consume you. Like when you're angry at somebody, like it consumes you, right? Or when you're frustrated about something, it consumes you and it feels so real. I will tell you something. Do you know what I teach my kids about feelings? Unless they line up with the word of God, they're lying to you. That's what I teach my kids. If your feelings match the word of God, great. If they don't, they're lying to you, okay? So humans, would you agree with this? They tend to want what they want, <laughs> right? Humans, man, we want what we want. And this applies to both believers and non-believers. Why? We all have the flesh, right? Some of the most easygoing people in the world are people who are totally okay with not getting their own way. You ever notice that? People are just floating on the breeze. They don't care if they get their own way or not. Just these easygoing people. And this is something that I am actually, in a lot of ways, terrible at. And, but I've had to really pray about this. And I've had to meditate on and say, I don't have to get my own way to be happy. Right? And actually, some of the happier people are people who don't have to get their own way. Right? So we have this battle that Paul was talking about. We have the flesh, and we have what the Spirit wants, right? And the Spirit will always be contrary to the flesh, always. So when you sense these things start to rise up, if God's bringing change and he's doing something new, you have to say in that moment, wait a minute, the things that I'm feeling right now that are so real to me, they're actually dead. Okay? And that will liberate you from those feelings controlling you. So our third note here is that when we trust God fully and completely, we don't need to get our own way. And that is liberating. It frees you. When you trust God, you don't have to get your own way. And you'll be a lot happier. When God brings change into your life, as we studied last week, we have to see this as this opportunity to grow and mature. We also have to realize that the resistance to God leading our lives in new ways that we haven't seen before, we have to see that while we experience these feelings of resistance and frustration or desire to get what we want out of the situation, despite those things feeling so real, we're actually dead to them. Not only are we dead to those things, we're dead to them in the same way that man is destined to death while separated from the life of God without salvation. It's the same thing. They're the same word, same definition in Scripture. So these feelings may seem real, but wait five minutes. They won't be so real anymore, right? Unless you're one of those people who can stay angry for 24 hours straight. Some people can do that. They're angry for a long time, but, but after 24 hours, those feelings aren't so real anymore, are they? So they come and go, and one day you're up, and the next day you're down, and they change all the time, and they are unreliable. We are dead to the things that seem so real if they don't line up with the Word of God. We are dead to what we want even when what we want seems so real. We are dead to having to get our own way, even if we think that's the best or what's right. We're dead to thoughts, feelings, and passions that go against the word of God, no matter how real they feel to us in the moment. We gain victory over rebellion against God when we realize that we are dead to the works of the flesh. So when God brings change into your life and those feelings of wanting to resist or control his leading, stop yourself 
and remind yourself, wait a minute, I'm dead to this, and that is dead to me. It's dead. So this point is illustrated in the preceding verses in Romans 6. <clears throat> so when we look at Romans 6, this is from last week, but we didn't look at the preceding verses. Romans 6, starting in verse 2, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus are baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we may too live a new life. So let's go back to Romans 7. Romans 7, 4 teaches us that the purpose of dying to the law is so that we may bear spiritual fruit and give glory to God. When we go on to Romans 7, 5, for when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work within us so that we bore fruit for death. So while in the flesh... The law aroused sinful passion resulting in fruit for death, very much the opposite of fruit for life that is born of the Holy Spirit. The law was the old way. Jesus Christ is the new way. The law in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, Jesus Christ, is the fulfillment of the law. Yes, he is newness of life and eternal, never-ending life newness. So because the law was the old way, we're going to look at Romans 7, 4 through 6, and wherever it said law, we're going to plug in old way. And it reads like this. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the old way through the body of Christ so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. So when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passion aroused by the old way were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what we once, once, once bound us, we have been released from the old way so that we serve in the new way of the spirit, not in the old way of the written code. So when God is leading you a new way in your life, it's not the old way way. You can't keep the old way and embrace the new way at the same time. You have to let go of one to grab hold of the other. And if you don't let go of one to grab hold of the other, you're going to tear yourself in two. And that's why I made this image on the back of your insert. There's an old way and a new way. And if you insist on I must have the old way while trying to stretch and reach for the new way at the same time, eventually what will happen? You're going to be torn between those two. God says, put your hand to the plow and do not look back. He says, keep your eyes heavenward and focused on the goal and focus on the prize that I strive for in Christ Jesus. I am looking one way. I am going forward. I am going onwards. I am going upwards. That's what God says all throughout Scripture. We cannot be people who want to hold on to the old way and then expect God to do something new, and we hold him so tightly, what it's going to do, it tears us. So that's what we all sense within us, and it's what Paul was saying. When God is doing something new in our flesh, which we are to consider dead, when our flesh is craving what once was, the old way, the familiar, what we already know, the new way forward is fresh, it's exciting, it's innovative, full of opportunity, and these are found in the newness of life that Christ gives us. When we look at Romans 7 going on into verse 6, but now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So in Jesus Christ, we are dead.
dead to the works of the flesh for gaining salvation, but also to anything that rebels against the word of God. We've, we, we're, we're studying that we are dead to these things. The, whoops. Ah, I flipped my page the wrong way there. Okay. So we have been released from the law, from the old way of doing things. Here, meaning that the law, the old way, has become, in Greek this says, completely inoperative. Okay? The law, earning salvation, the old way, what, what God used to be doing, okay, before in our lives. So to consider yourself released from that, you need to say it is completely inoperative in my life. Okay? Completely inoperative. For a believer, salvation cannot be gained through self-effort. That was the old way. Je and, it, and it was never enough. Jesus Christ is the new way. Gaining salvation through self-effort has become completely inoperative. God has released us from doing things the old way. And he draws us into doing things the new way in Jesus. And what does this look like in the Christian life? Paul says to serve in the new way of the Spirit. God brings newness. It's the same word that's used in Romans 6.4. Walk in newness of life. To serve and live in new ways. So remember the defin here, definition here is that it wasn't found exactly like this before. When you go God's way, you should be expecting new things. <laughs> when you go God's way, you should be expecting, oh, this, this is interesting. I've never, I haven't seen anything like this before. That's kind of cool. That's what, that's what the scripture is saying here. That's what these deeper Greek meanings are meaning here is that it's, it's not found like it was before. Like, we as believers should not be a people who it's the same old, same old. We should be people who's like, yes, God is moving in my life. Yes, God is answering prayer. Yes, he's teaching me things. Yes, he's doing new things in my life. Like uh, Melissa was sharing, she said, saying yes to what God wants to do. Stretching you, pulling you new things. Like, like God wants to do a new work, but if we are, 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 are dead set on holding on to what was, we will just be broken between the two. So it's not found exactly like this before. So the way we live and serve the new way of the Spirit, today and tomorrow, doesn't always look like the same as it did a week ago or five months ago or a year ago or 20 years ago. It's the new way of the Spirit. God brings new things leading our lives uh, to keep things moving forwards and onwards and upwards. And these things should be exciting to the believer. God provided Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that through his shed blood to all who would receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they'd be free from the law, the old way, and live and serve God and others in a very new way, in a way that hasn't been seen like this before. So what this really points to is what does the vision for your life look like? What do we equate stability with? Do we trust God enough to be okay with change? Do we trust God enough to not get our own way? Do we trust God enough to have newness of life brought into our life on a continual basis and really just be fine with it and embrace it and celebrate it and just say, God, I'm willing to go along for the ride. Let's do it. Really, this is boiling down to trust. Do we trust God enough to be like, God, I don't have to get my own way. That's fine. I'll just, I'll go with you. Yeah, let's do this. Really all boils down to trust. Or... Do we continue, so I'm talking about the new way, right, of, of, of serving in the spirit and living in the spirit, or do we continue in the old way, letting our feelings and our thoughts, the way things were, our routines, our expectations remain the same, boxing us into what we want for our lives 
excluding the newness of life to enter in for fear that it might bring something uncomfortable or unexpected. You know, we live in a world where it's almost like a crime to make someone feel uncomfortable. You know, like, like that's like a catchphrase, like, well, I'm not comfortable. Well, I don't think Jesus was always comfortable, right? Like the death on the cross and, and the beating and scourging and the crown of thorns and like, is he wasn't comfy in those things. And you know, Jesus didn't have the out of being uncomfortable. Like, Jesus wasn't able to say, um, while he's being scourged, I'm sorry, this makes me uncomfortable. Like, sorry, I really can't do that, you know. I know that I have to bear the sins of the entire world, but this makes me uncomfortable, so I'm going to pass. Like, it, right? Like, because why? Because Jesus sought to do the will of the Father, right? Because Jesus was about his Father's business. He wasn't a, and he was God. But I'm just saying, like, what an example. Like, guys, like, like you have to understand, too, when I'm talking up here, I'm, I'm talking to me, right? So it, it's like, we're not always going to be comfortable. And things that make us uncomfortable, we have to grow through them. And we have to see them as like, you know what? God's trying to mature me here, and I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do it, and guess what? I don't have to get my own way. That's okay, right? So God provided this newness of life in Jesus Christ. So when we do not embrace and celebrate this freedom from the law for salvation, as well as freedom from the old way of doing things, we cheapen the death of Christ by not taking full advantage of what he's come to offer us, and that is newness of life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that... Uh, there's just so much good in your word. I pray that you help us to look at um, change and newness in our lives that you bring as, while it may not always be comfortable, at the same time, it's necessary. And you are about newness of life. You, Christ came and died. He lived and died and he, he bled and died to give us this eternal newness of life. Help us to know that when we trust you, we can be totally okay with not getting our own way. And actually, you have this wonderful plan for us, full of newness. Help us to trust you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, uh, just before we um, uh, sing together again, I just want to um, say that the altar is this altar is open for prayer where it's something that um, Mike and I, uh, the elders, have talked about. If you need to come forward uh, for prayer uh, during these, these last, uh, last song or last few songs, come forward and pray at the altar. And um, anybody can come forward and pray with you. But I just want to say, this is open should you, uh, should you desire to come forward this morning. Let's all stand. Love the God. 
his foes, light crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen, and as the sword is rolled away. Oh, 
so just uh, if you can, uh, you can be seated if you want to. It shouldn't take long for announcements, but if you want to be seated, that's fine. Uh, just a few announcements for today. Um, MomCo is starting again this um, Wednesday, uh, September 11th at 6 p.m. Uh, so that's restarting for this year. Liz, did you want to say anything else about that? Oh, sure. Yep. <laughs> Hi, guys. How are you? Good. I'm, How are you? I'm doing well, Sebi. Thank you. Great. My name is Holly Houston, just in case you don't know who I am. Um, I am a member of MomCo, and we are super excited that it's coming back. Um, our new um, theme for MomCo this year is Wild Hope, and that's super exciting for me. Um, and I would like to first thank you for our, your support over the years. We have, it's crazy how God grows things. Um, we have grown to, last year we were sitting and filling the back tables. It was awesome. And I'm super excited about this year. Um, so on Wednesday nights, there are a bunch of other groups as well. So there's a men's group, there's a women's group, there's a prayer group, there's a youth group, and uh, nursery, kid zone, a mom co. And we want you to all come to at least one of these groups because they're fun and we have a great time. Um, Liz would like me to share a couple of verses with you, um, specifically about our theme, which is Wild Hope this year. Um, Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is the tree of life. Wild hope means being open to receive. Mark 10, 51, what do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. The blind man responded with, I want to see. Blind hope, praying in God that he will give us what his will is. Also, it, part of our theme this year is to build endurance. Romans 5, 3 through 5, not only so, but we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, character, and hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And another thing we're going to learn this year is to live passionately. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. I have been in this group for a couple of years, and this is a group that inspires me and encourages me and supports me in the things that I need most. When I need prayer, these are the women I go to first. These are the women that have my back and just I can call on for anything. So I ask that you guys will pray for MomCo this year, that we have a successful year. We hope that uh, two more volunteers will join us for nursery and another program. There are, we are in need of two volunteers. We have currently 14 children, which is amazing, to bring children into this group, into this church, and we love that. So we are in need of one worsery worker and one floater that will go between the groups. So if you have any questions, um, ask Liz or come see myself. And I just ask that you guys pray for us. Thank you. Protect his house. Um, we are having an um, a active shooter defense training class September 21st. If you, have, if you want to come to that, uh, Brent wanted me to point out that you need to register. So see the, um, the sign back there? You actually have to register for it um, because there's a limited number of spaces. You can't just come, okay? So if you do want to come, please see. You can either see Brent or you can see the, um, the sign that's back there as well. Um, you have to register for that one. Um, also, Ladies Bible Study on Tuesday morning is beginning again. Um, that's beginning on 9.17, starting at 9.30 a.m. Fall refocus, if you see your insert, uh, this is coming up September 27th through 28th. You can check out information there. If you have any further questions about Alliance Women's Fall Refocus, you can ask Melanie um, about that. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Invite um, any woman who wants to come to our district 
um, retreat, fall refocus. Um, registration is online, and there's a link up here and in your bulletin, but if you do not use the computer and you want to go and register, please see me and I can take care of that for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep, fall refocus there. Uh, lastly, we have, or second to last rather, uh, grief share, loss of a spouse, that's coming up on the 14th, if you know of, of this could be a uh, benefit to anyone who is grieving the death of a spouse. Um, you can refer them to Faye in the back. So if, if anybody is interested in that as well. Um, birthdays and anniversaries this week, we have, um, we have Reese Brayman, 99, uh, Jacob Hanville, uh, Braylon Savage, Casey and Liz Roan, Kaya Roan, and me on next Saturday. <laughs> so happy birthday to me now. <laughs> um, so anyways, um, we have that, and I think Mike, Mike, you had one announcement as well about um, lyrics, things like that. Yes, what was the announcement about? Pulling, pulling uh, lyrics. Um. Oh, yes, yeah, if anyone, um, for the song slides each, each week, um, we'd, if you're interested at all in helping to create those lyric slides, um, it's easier than PowerPoint if you've ever done that, so come and see me and, uh, and I'll be happy to talk to you more about it. Okay. All right. That's what that announcement was about. So, <laughs> All right. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day. I pray that uh, you would use us to go out into the world and be vessels for you, that we would be a light to a dark world, uh, that you would create situations um, where we can uh, share the good news of Jesus Christ with people that we meet. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.